imagine uh, this is, I don't know that there's ever been a better example of the blind leading the blind. Uh, Jane has done a tremendous job in uh, trying to work through the, the uh, technology here and hopefully, hopefully it'll work and this will be the beginning of an opportunity for us to communicate on an ongoing basis through these, uh, these webinars. And today's, uh, today's presentation really is meant both as a practice presentation but also to give folks a bit of a historical perspective as to where we've come and where we're going and to start off by presenting a, a definition of equity that will at least provide us a point of departure for dialogue and discussion. Uh, the, uh, the definition will be showing up in, um, in a policy statement uh, in pediatrics through the AAP and as I'll mention later on was really the, um, the brainchild to a great extent of folks with uh, ESOP and the Royal College and Elspeth Webb and Nick Spencer and a host of other folks. So why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, there's been a history, there's been a journey that have uh, that we've been on here to get us to this point. Uh, probably we need to go back to the beginning, which is really the founding of the European Society for Social Pediatrics, um, which is uh, which goes back uh, almost 30 years. Nick Spencer, as many of you know, is the current uh, president of the of the organization. It's had a long, uh, esteemed history of really uh, dealing with. Uh, social issues and social pediatrics issues uh, primarily uh, in Europe. The next thing that happened uh, was uh, Tony Waterston and Tom Tonages, Tony from the Royal College and Tom from the Academy of Pediatrics, uh, really uh, inaugurated a, uh, an opportunity for us uh, at a visit that Tony made here to the U.S. Um, where uh, we began to talk about the potential of creating a linkage between the Academy and the Royal College to look at social pediatrics issues and begin to delve into the question as to uh, why children in the U.S. and the U.K., despite the fact that uh, people and the children in the U.K. had universal access to health care, why our statistics were so poor with respect to children's health and well-being. Uh, we met uh, uh, first in the U.K. and then subsequently here in the United States and launched uh, what has become to be called the Equity Project, looking at for the first time uh, really defining equity and introducing the context of equity formally into the parlance here at the Academy and uh, here in the United States through the Academy and in the UK through the Royal College. Then um, the next stop on the journey, so to speak, was a chance meeting um, between me and Raul uh, at the Nessop meeting in Montreal and was uh, where I was invited to talk to the Argentine Pediatric Society at one of their meetings and Raul and Andrea Schoen um, were instrumental in making that, uh, that happen. And what became very clear uh, to me at that point in time what th was that there was a whole world of uh, organizations outside of the United States that have moved far along the continuum of developing formal social pediatric programs and, uh, and societies and so on. And that we here in the U.S. were uh, essentially way behind the curve in really constructing the context of social pediatrics and formalizing it in the context of our societies. Um, and so uh, we began to talk about how we could do that here in the United States. We formed uh, a bit of a partnership, a loose partnership then uh, with the University of Victoria and their, uh, their program called Child Rights Education for Professionals. And Stuart Hart, who's not on the phone uh, today on the, s on the webinar today, but Jerison Lansdowne, who it looks uh, is on the webinar, uh, began to talk about how we could work together to introduce the concept of children's rights and the principles and practice of children's rights uh, into the pediatric profession. And so out of this then came a loose, uh, loose coalition, a loose uh, um, organizational structure that, in, that linked the European Society, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Royal College, the Argentinian Pediatric Society, University of Victoria, um, and uh, a number of other organizations uh, together to begin to talk about how we can formalize this effort to, um, uh, to begin to integrate the, the principles and practice of uh, equity, but in particular 
uh, children's rights and social justice into our work uh, in uh, across the world. Um, the, what came out of that first uh, first set of uh, discussions, and in particular out of the uh, equity project, first was the development of a curriculum, a training curriculum, to introduce the principles of uh, children's rights into practice. And Jerris and Lansdowne took the lead on that. Tony Waterston, through the Royal College, and I, through the Academy, uh, participated in that. And out of that came a, a formalized curriculum that has uh, been distributed uh, uh, well, was distributed uh, in through the academy and through the Royal College to begin to uh, train people or to use to train people in introducing the principles of children's rights uh, into practice. And uh, we owe Jerison a, a great deal of gratitude for actually taking the lead in uh, putting that initial, uh, initial curriculum together. Um, the, uh, the next step that happened was uh, 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 Raul Mercer, uh, through the Argentinian uh, uh, Society of Pediatrics, uh, organized a Southern Cone Initiative, which integrated Argentine, Argentina, uh, Colombia, Chile, and Uruguay into a working group to take the initial curriculum that we had established, translate it into uh, Spanish, and then take the curriculum and uh, basically revise it so that it was relevant to the work that was happening in the Southern Cone. Uh, that work was uh, in part funded by the um, uh, by, by CredPro uh, and has been ongoing now for uh, several years and has really developed a, uh, a, uh, a wonderful curriculum that's relevant to South America and has taken on a whole new life of its own with much, much work happening now in, uh, in the respective countries in the, um, in the Southern Cone. Um, that, uh, based on that effort and that work then, uh, that, uh, that process then was, uh, was taken to, uh, uh, to Africa in particular, where uh, Jerison has been working in Tanzania and uh, also in South Africa to take that initial curriculum and adapt it to those particular countries and, and expand it. Again, that work has been uh, continued to be supported by uh, by CredPro, and then uh, Adam Ar Arcadis, who's uh, I don't see him on the uh, webinar, has uh, worked with us through uh, the International uh, Children's Center in Turkey to do something very similar in Turkey and in countries uh, in that region of the world. So that first nidus of work uh, that started uh, with a chance meeting in a sense between Tony and Tom uh, Tonages and then expanded through uh, another coincidental meeting with uh, myself and uh, Raul and with the support of a number of organizations including the Academy and the Royal College and uh, the support of Nick and ESOP uh, and uh, our Southern Cone colleagues has really blossomed into a, um, a, a, a global initiative to uh, to expand our work in the context of introducing the principles and practice of uh, children's rights and health equity into our work in pediatrics. What happened next was, uh, was uh, the iteration by uh, Elspeth Webb of a first attempt to really take the concept of equity, in this case child health equity, um, and turn it into something very tangible. And uh, Elspeth, through the uh, through ESOP and through the Royal College, uh, put together a first working draft of a essentially a policy statement on a child health uh, equity. That work um, was then uh, expanded uh, so that we could use the use the initial work that she had done as the basis for a policy statement that would be published through the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, and that initial work then uh, was translated through the uh, council at the academy, um, the Council on Community Pediatrics, uh, and a couple of other committees uh, in the academy. Uh, I, I'm really very excited to say after four years of, uh, of uh, bureaucracy and work that the, um, <coughs> that, that uh, equity statement now has been accepted by the academy and is in line uh, to, be, um, to be published. It would not be appropriate then to recognize the work also of Barbara Starfield, who had been um, with a number of colleagues, had create, has created an international 
national group on health equity, uh, which we were in contact with when we first began these, uh, this dialogue and discussion. Uh, and the decision was made to really focus uh, on a separate group uh, where we could concentrate on child health equity and children's issues as opposed to uh, necessarily at that point in time uh, joining the, uh, the larger group that uh, focused on adults as well as children. That brought us up to a uh, couple of years ago uh, where we in the United States then found it, uh, it uh, really necessary to look at how we could uh, create a formal organization that would focus on social pediatrics that then could uh, really relate to uh, the international groups that were also working in this field. In collaboration with the Academy and in discussion with the Academy, it was decided that rather than develop this as a, um, as a committee or part of the Academy, that we could work faster but continue to work in collaboration by establishing a separate organization. And uh, several years ago, we put out a call to people uh, to meet us at their own expense in Chicago where um, we had about 30 or so folks that came. And uh, that was the point at which uh, we formally launched the Society for Equity in Child Health, uh, again, which was meant to work as a independent entity but in close collaboration with the Academy and with the Academic Pediatric Association and other colleagues uh, in pediatrics. Initially and continue to today, the society has been framed in the context of developing it as an interdisciplinary group, group though we have not really successfully uh, reached out to other disciplines at this, at this point in time. But that certainly is the expectation that we have as we, uh, as we move forward. The next step in this journey and getting uh, close to where we are today uh, was that uh, since we had so many different international groups uh, and organizations that were working informally in the same, uh, same arena, that we decided for purposes of uh, trying to organize ourselves that we would establish a alliance of these different groups, which we are calling the Global Alliance for Child Rights and Health Equity with the sense and the expectation that this was not meant to be a group that dealt with the full inventory of, uh, of disciplines uh, to which children's rights relate, but to really focus on this as the intersection between health and uh, children's rights. And this group, uh, again, has continued to grow and, uh, uh, and engage those uh, international groups and organizations and individuals who are interested in, um, in this uh, in, this, in these issues. And so the accomplishments, uh, accomplishments have, been, um, um, uh, have been varied and there have been a number of them that the, uh, the accomplishments that we would include in this inventory and there are others. Uh, as first, a, um, for those of you who are part of the Academy, the work that we initially did as part of the equity project uh, was published as a supplement to pediatrics and really has stood as uh, the foundation of, uh, of supporting uh, these efforts. I mentioned the curriculum in child rights for professionals uh, which was published first as a joint effort of the Academy and Royal College. It's now been published in, in a number of different uh, languages and has been adapted to a number of different cultures and communities. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, eventually established uh, uh, health equity as part of its strategic plan and if you go on the Academy's website you'll see um, you'll see that uh, explicated uh, and that really was the work of Tom Tonages to work with the board to um, uh, to integrate equity uh, into into the strategic plan. We've had a number of conferences the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health has uh, implemented a number of initiatives, including, I think, really very importantly, the uh, implementation of a formal position within the Royal College of an ombudsperson uh, whose role is to ensure that children have a voice in the work of the, of the Royal College. And uh, they have really taken the lead in, um, in advancing the issue of climate change as a critical children's rights and health equity, health equity issue. We've had a number of publications. As you'll see in a few moments, uh, we have developed a website for the uh, Forsetch as well as for the, um, 
of the Global Alliance. The Southern Cone has implemented wonderful initiatives and expanded our work uh, significantly in South America. Uh, again, we've had initiatives now going on in Tanzania and South Africa. Uh, the International Children's Commission has working hard to expand uh, this uh, throughout their region. Uh, we've had the, uh, the first uh, international video conference, uh, April 1st, uh, which launched uh, our attempt to use uh, inter uh, video technology uh, to engage uh, colleagues around the world. We had 17 cities and 10 countries uh, to focus on climate change, global climate change, and its relationship to health equity. We had a number of speakers from around the world that participated in that. The technology didn't work perfectly, but um, I think it did uh, indicate to us that we can use this technology to develop a global uh, network of colleagues uh, um, uh, to advance this work. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, the equity policy statement, which will show up in pediatrics hopefully, uh, hopefully this year. Um, so getting back to the Society for Equity in Child Health, it was established in 2006. Um, as you can see bolded, um, uh, its purpose and its mission is to really integrate the principles of equity, social justice, and child rights into child health practice. And again, we're working with the Academy and with the Ambulatory Pediatric Association, which is now the Academic Pediatric Association, and others to uh, advance, uh, advance, this, uh, advance this work. And by mistake, I went too far, so let me get to where we are. Um, and uh, the vision uh, of the society is uh, full respect for human rights of every child and just allocation of the resources required to ensure his or her optimal health and development and well-being. And as you can see, our mission is to ensure um, that uh, the optimal health and well-being of children through the principles and practice of equity, social justice, and children's rights. Um, we, we established such, um, we established it with a number of organizational goals. Um, as you can see there, uh, those included research, education and training, practice and program development, advocacy and public policy, and collaboration, and the goal of to integrate our work with other groups around, uh, around the country and around the world. Um, the societal goals were to establish environments uh, conducive to optimal health and well-being of children, to ensure the best interests of children are considered and promoted at all levels of society, to provide children a voice, and to ensure the full rights of children, as outlined in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, are extended to all, all children. So the common theme that has worked through SETCH, uh, the Society for Equity in Child Health, and through the Alliance and through our work, has really been built on the foundation and the framework of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so if there's a theme to our work, it really is how do we take the principles and articles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child of Children's Rights and integrate it into our work um, in pediatrics and through interdisciplinary collaboration with other colleagues and other disciplines and from our perspective here in the United States uh, with other organizations globally uh, who are in some in some respects uh, far ahead of us uh, in uh, in their work. Um, and as I mentioned previously, uh, because of the number of colleagues and number of organizations that had come together to work informally, we felt the need to actually establish a venue, a place for us all uh, to come together and establish the Global Alliance for Child Rights and Health Equity, which was meant to establish the venue where uh, countries and organizations uh, could work together at the intersection of child health equity and child rights um, in the uh, in the context of uh, of the health health professions and so that group but uh, now has been working together formally over the past year or so uh, it has a mission a vision and mission that is very similar to uh, the Society for Equity and Child Health um, and a set of goals and um, uh, goals that again reverberate and resonate with those uh, um, those same um, those same goals as such. And as you can see from the um, from the alliance goals, that the first 
really the to ensure the best interests of children and ensure that children are listened to and taken seriously. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, those are uh, several of the um, or at least two of the four critical pillars of the um, of uh, child uh, child rights. And so the charter members of the alliance were the Society for Equity and Child Health, uh, ESOP, uh, European Society of Social Pediatrics, uh, the Academy and Royal College through the Equity Project. Uh, Flaxo is uh, the home for the Southern Cone Initiative, which is the Latin American University of Social Sciences, uh, CredPro, the International Children's Center, the University of Ottawa. Um, and we have a host of other organizations now that have joined the Alliance. And uh, as, we'll, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, the Alliance provides not only a place for organizations, but also individuals who want to participate, want to receive the information that will be going out uh, through the Alliance and such, are more than welcome uh, to join, uh, to join uh, join the Alliance internationally, and those of you who are in the U.S. and the U.K., we'd like to find uh, we'd like for you to find a home both in the Society for Equity Child Health uh, as well as uh, in the in the Alliance. So um, to uh, to link to the two websites, both of which are uh, works in progress, but we're working hard to. Um, to make them uh, really very viable and rigorous places to gain information and to participate in dialogue. Uh, you can see uh, uh, presented the two websites um, for the Society for Equity and Child Health and the Global Alliance for Child Rights and Health Equity. Uh, Jane is working very hard to help us uh, with those. Uh, and Adam Arcadis uh, from Turkey in the International Children's Center will be taking a lead role in organizing the the website for the for the global for the global alliance. So that gets us pretty much through the um, through the historical perspective of how we got to where we're going and hopefully it will be a point of departure for us uh, all as we move uh, as we move move forward. What I'd like to do for the next few minutes is to um, to frame uh, the context of uh, and the definition of child health equity as a point of departure for us as we move forward. And this work has been done over the past four years or so as a, as a collaboration and as a working group of most, if not all, of the members uh, of the alliance that, uh, um, that uh, were presented uh, previously. And again, Elspeth Webb and uh, her colleagues, uh, Nick and Tony and a number of other folks uh, in the uh, Royal College and ESOP really took the lead in um, providing a, an initial tangible point of uh, discussion for us as to how we define health equity. And we found it really very important to do so because there had been a number of definitions of equity and a number of groups that had worked very, really very hard uh, to develop definitions. But we felt that if we were going to move forward uh, in an organized way, that we at least needed, uh, we needed a common set of definitions and a common parlance uh, to frame uh, frame our discussion, recognizing that uh, we had every expectation that that parlance would be organic and that it would change over time as we learned more and developed more experience with the terms and uh, and the use of those terms actually translated into practice. And as I mentioned previously, uh, the concept and, um, of uh, child health equity. Uh, will be presented as a policy statement in uh, in the in pediatrics through the academy um, in the uh, in the near future. So um, there have been a there have been a number of attempts to actually define equity, and this uh, this definition is as good as any. Uh, and again, we need to thank uh, Barbara Starfield and Nick Spencer for a lot of their work in actually helping to define uh, these terms uh, in the literature. Um, and so the definition uh, for equity that really uh, really frames frames this, begins to frame the discussion is is presented here. Um, uh, where systematic differences in health are judged to be avoidable by reasonable action, they are quite simply unfair. It is this that we uh, label uh, health inequity. And the important piece here, um, if I can try to use the follow the bouncing ball, uh, it, the, the 
important phrase here are differences and judge to be avoidable. Uh, when we use the term equity, we're not talking about equality. That's a very different term. Uh, the, the, the term equity really relates to differences that are avoidable and which can be mitigated, where reasonable action can actually change the environment that is, is, that is causing inequities or causing inequalities uh, between individuals or between groups of people. Uh, so this is really the foundation, the foundational definition uh, that um, I think most of us um, would accept uh, as a point of departure for our work. Um, I'm going to have to apologize. All right. The, the, the next term that uh, we want to present is the concept of human rights. And as we'll see in a, in a few moments, um, let me see if I missed a slide here. All right. Um, the next term that we wanted to use and to, to begin to define is the term human rights, which uh, may seem a bit uh, ludicrous because we all know what human rights actually are. Uh, but when we actually get to a point of trying to talk about it in an organized way, uh, human rights really means different things to different people. And uh, many of us know Sophia Graskin um, and Dickens, and I like to use uh, their term um, and their definition uh, because it moves the it moves the term of human rights from a uh, from a noun actually to a verb. It moves it from a very theoretical concept uh, to one that actually provides us a tool that we can use to actually uh, then accomplish uh, health equity. And as you can see in front of you, uh, the that uh, they use uh, they use the context of human rights as being a useful framework for a tool for shaping national laws and policies and for a tool for ensuring accountability and as an approach a useful approach for promoting public public health so they've taken the term human rights and and transformed it from a very ethereal theoretical concept to actually a functional tangible tool uh, that we can use to, uh, to translate these principles actually into, into practice. The next term which we would put on the table and in a moment we'll see how they all fit together is the concept of social justice. And again, uh, the term social justice is used in, in many ways um, and uh, it has uh, many different definitions. But if you actually distill it down to its uh, essence, basically what social justice is all about is how we allocate limited limited resources. And so we, in situations where the pie is finite, how do we actually distribute those resources? And with the focus on, on child health equity, then how do we distribute those resources uh, using the principles of children's rights in many respects to uh, um, uh, advance the health and well-being of, of children. So social justice then translates in our parlance or the parlance we're presenting as a point of departure for discussion as the as how do the is as the allocation of limited resources. Um, the next piece to the uh, to this definition of uh, health equity is um, is the concept of human capital. Um, and so most people understand the concept of capital and uh, perhaps our, um, the concept of social capital has been, the, has been most recently the, um, an, an effort to actually take the, the framework of financial capital and turn it into a sociological term which has been, been used now for the last decade or so. But what we are what we are presenting is the concept of human capital as, as it relates to children, and it defines a value for the investment of human capital relationships and reconstructs the world of children and adults as the sum total of these investments and relationships. And so what we are um, what we are presenting is the concept of capital as it relates to children. Um, and we will be talking about capital investment in the context of educational capital, environmental capital, social capital, financial capital, and personal capital. And the, t the terminology personal capital, as, uh, as will be better presented uh, more in, in more depth in the policy statement, is really, is really all about hope. 
It's really all about how do we invest in the capital of children uh, so that they have a sense of the future and a sense of, and a sense of hope. Perhaps a little bit uh, less tangible than the other forms of capital, uh, but nevertheless uh, um, as important as those other, um, those other uh, uh, elements of, of, of capital, human capital. And last but not least is this concept of equity-based ethics. And uh, what this is, and we'll sh I'll, I'll show you a couple slides in a second, um, but we came to, a, we came to a, a sort of a dead end uh, when we began to talk about the question of, of what are the ethics of health equity. And we had a foundation, a, f a set of foundational principles in, in biomedical ethics um, and uh, that we have used in the health arena for um, a number of decades. Uh, but they fell quite, quite short in really creating a framework for the evaluation and assessment um, of, of what happens to children outside of the hospital with respect to, um, to understanding the ethics of what, what happens to children in our communities. Uh, and so we, we, felt really, we felt the need to, for an, a new set of ethical principles uh, to, uh, to be able to use in this context. And out of that came then um, the, a, a work that is really just beginning, uh, really just beginning. Um, and we sat down and looked at um, the critical core elements of children's rights or the principles of children's rights, which are presented on the left of this matrix, uh, which are non-discrimination, promoting the best interest, survival and development, and listening to and taking uh, children seriously. So although the, uh, one of the principles of children's rights is that it's a whole, that the convention is holistic and that all the rights that are, are presented there relate to all children, there are four core principles of children's rights in the convention. And these four articles are presented on the left side of the matrix. And if you take the four core components of, of, uh, of biomedical ethics or medical ethics of beneficence, justice, non-malfeasance, and autonomy, uh, and line them up with the core four principles of children's rights, they align really very well with non-discrimination being uh, relating to beneficence, promoting the best interests relating to justice, survival and development uh, relating to non-malfeasance, and listening to and taking children seriously uh, the principle of autonomy. So that really provided us a wonderful a foundation to, to look at how we could relate then the core principles of biomedical ethics to the, uh, to the ethics of uh, uh, children's rights, but in particular how we could use it as a tool for, um, for our work as we moved uh, into the future. And if you, if you uh, and this may be a little small for people to actually read, um, but if you then take the taxonomy of rights presented in the convention, economic, cultural, social, protective, and civil and political rights, created an inventory of the actual articles of the convention that relate to those rights, you can actually then relate the inventory of rights, these articles in the convention, uh, directly to the uh, biomedical ethical principles. And so now we've been able then to take the four core principles of medical ethics, the four core principles of children's rights, and actually then expand that to, uh, to be able to use and relate them to all of the rights that are, are, are contained in the Convention on the Rights of the Child which, again, we're just at the beginning of this dialogue and discussion as to how we use this tool, but it then prov now provides us a way of, um, of we think, of translating the, f the concept of biomedical ethics into a broader context of health equity ethics and provides another, s another tool that we can use as, uh, as we move uh, forward in this uh, journey in trying to define what actually is child health equity and how do we translate it into, into practice. Having said that then, um, let me move into, into the next and last part of this discussion, which is now how do we take these, these principles and how are we suggesting that we move forward in uh, implementing them into, into practice. 
Well, if we if we take uh, as a starting point, at least for those of us here in the U.S. and to a certain extent in other developing countries, um, if we take as a starting point the concept that there's been a real very demographic uh, transition in our children. And uh, for those of you who know who Norman Rockwell was, the um, uh, who was an illustrator that presented very romantic uh, romanticized pictures of the world and he had a very romanticized picture as to who our who children were and uh, how and 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 who they were in the doctor's office so to speak uh, but if you if you really take a look at who our children are here in the United States um, most of them are living in single parent families uh, the majority will be minority in a relatively short period of time uh, about half of them are actually living in functional poverty many of them are moving from place to place and if you if you added up uh, the reality that children are living in uh, which is presented in the right side of the slide they're homeless they're in foster care incarcerated and so on and so forth we're actually talking about a significant minority perhaps a majority of children are living um, in um, in uh, are living either with special health care needs um, and or uh, significantly impacted by social environmental determinants if you take a look then at uh, at where we are at least in our evolution here um, in the United States, but I think this relates to many places around the world. Um, there's been an epidemiological transition in the context of, of pediatrics and child health. Uh, if you look back as to where our profession started, it really started as a focus with a focus on infectious disease and nutrition. And then Dr. Haggerty, uh, several decades ago, suggested that we needed to move uh, along a continuum to move beyond infectious diseases and nutrition to focus on behavior and development of chronic diseases. And as presented most recently by um, Judy Palfrey and uh, Dr. Richmond in a recent, uh, relatively recent publication in pediatrics, um, they coined uh, the concept in the term of the millennial morbidities or a new, uh, a new uh, framework that we needed to be moving into in pediatrics that related to the social and environmental determinants of child health. So from, uh, from a set of morbidities, we've moved from the classical morbidities, we're still dealing with the new morbidities, but have now added the millennial morbidities. But if you look at our practice of pediatrics and child health, for the most part in the U.S. and U.K. and other developed countries, um, we're still really grounded in a, in a classical practice which is primarily framed around the care and treatment of infectious diseases and nutrition and um, the, um, the genesis of those issues are relatively irrelevant uh, to the morbidities impacting children today. So um, we recognize the millennial morbidities but we're still really focused on um, in a great sense in, uh, to a practice that and a discipline that's still framed primarily by the classical morbidities. So if you look now at what are the contemporary determinants for child health, what are the social and environmental determinants of children's health, which is primarily um, impacted by the millennial morbidities, uh, what you have here in front of you is just a brief list of uh, different social and environmental determinants that are impacting impacting children. If we took the time, uh, we could uh, uh, we could uh, expand this list many fold, and all of you would would add different uh, different issues, I'm sure, onto this. But it's just really an attempt to uh, begin to say that there are uh, many many social and environmental determinants that are impacting uh, children's health. And so if we wanted to create a movement to establish a new architecture for pediatrics, um, uh, we might start off with what we know as far as social epidemiology, um, the science behind uh, the millennial um, m morbidities, and then translate that into, into practice. So in a simplified way, uh, if we were to create a new millennial architecture, we'd start off with social epidemiology, um, identify the science, and translate that epidemiology and science into, into practice. And in an attempt to begin to do that, um, and we won't get into this in any detail, uh, what I've presented to you is, um, is what we know. 
and we have a a large inventory and a very very deep understanding of the social epidemiology of children's health and well-being uh, that includes uh, the work of Marmot with the White House studies and the work of uh, Barbara on the line here in the webinar today and Nick and a host of others uh, that have documented health disparities and the work of a number of people including Kawachi and, and Kennedy and a number of folks related to income inequality, uh, immigrant effects, adverse childhood experiences, on, on and on and on. So we've had this very deep understanding of social epidemiology over the years. Uh, but for those of you on the, uh, on the webinar today, I'm sure you have felt uh, what a number of us have felt in the past, and that is when you presented the social epidemiology, the next question uh, was, well, what's the science behind that? Um, and that was a very difficult question to answer uh, until the last decade or so. And over the last decade, uh, through the work of many, many people, um, we've been actually able to define the science, uh, which I uh, have uh, presented here in a very truncated form, uh, but we have a whole um, whole set of life course science, uh, uh, sciences now um, that have uh, really looked at how social and environmental uh, determinants actually get translated through neurodevelopmental pathways and endocrine pathways and so on and so forth. Uh, we have our whole new understanding of epigenetics that it's not just about the genetic predisposition predisposition that individuals have, but the environment in which those genes are expressed. We have all the wonderful work that's been done in early brain development and neuroendocrinology and developmental endocrinology and so on and so forth. So now in a sense we have, we have the science uh, behind the social epidemiology. And so where that brings us to is the question as to how do we translate the epidemiology and science into practice. And if 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 the if the if the classical approach uh, to pediatrics, if we if we relied on that classical approach to pediatrics, we would never be able to translate the science into practice. And so the punchline, so to speak, is that we're going to need a whole new framework, a whole new set of tools to take to translate what we know about sci this, uh, the science of social epidemiology and actually translate it into practice. And that, those set of tools and that framework uh, we're presenting and suggesting comes under the umbrella of health equity. And the sets of tools that we'll need to use in the future are the tools of ch child rights and social justice and human capital investment. And, and health equity ethics. And so then this becomes a point of departure for discussion as we move forward as to how we use this context to translate epidemiology and science into practice. Um, and there's no one suggesting um, that uh, the full validity of this, this is really just beginning as, uh, as a point of departure, so to speak, for discussion um, and years from now this we may find this has little relevance uh, but at least it's a way of beginning um, beginning the dialogue and discussion and so the practice of health equity if we framed it in a in a simple diagram would be how do we take the social epidemiology translate it through advocacy into health outcomes and that advocacy functioning in the context and using the tools of human rights social justice human capital investment and health equity ethics and to put it in another framework how do we use this equity toolkit how do we develop an equity toolkit to frame the practice of pediatrics at the clinical level at the community level and the public policy level using the principles of uh, equity as the tools for accomplishing these uh, these outcomes um, and uh, this is another way of, of framing it, again, translating social epidemiology through the, pro the, um, the, uh, the uh, tools of equity um, using advocacy as the framework for doing that to accomplish these outcomes. And advocacy at the clinical level, at the community level, and at the public policy level, suggesting that all health practitioners and pediatricians will need to work at the clinical and, pub and community level, and some will work at the public policy level as, as well. 
So if we put it into a health systems framework, uh, we have a new set of determinants for children's health that uh, reflect themselves and morbidities that now are defined as a millennial morbidities. We have, to do, we have to generate a whole new set of equity index indicators, which uh, many of you on the webinar are working hard on. There are a number of initiatives uh, globally to really redefine these equity indicators. Uh, we um, translate uh, our work in, in maternal and child health at these three levels using a toolkit that includes these tools uh, to accomplish uh, health outcomes. And so this then becomes a way of beginning to frame, uh, frame our, uh, our work in the future. And so if we want to then take the um, dissect the equity toolkit, uh, the first um, the first question is well what are these equity tools and um, and uh, that really gets us to uh, to where we were a couple years ago and there have been a number of us who have been working together to really um, to really take the tools that we currently have and 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 really frame them in the context of an equity toolkit and so if we if we if we take a step back here and say the if we distill down the work that we do in medicine, in health, it's really, it's really diagnosing um, and intervening. And, uh, uh, and in the past, the context for that has been a, um, a classical context of infectious diseases. Um, and now we're suggesting that the new context for doing this would be a health equity context. And so the tools that we have for the contextual tools relate to um, human rights documents and the, and, the, and the principles of social justice and the uh, science of life course and neurobiology and early brain development and a host of, um, uh, of perspectives uh, that go back a number of years, one of which is the uh, the principles that came out of Alma Ada, the principles that came out of the Ottawa Charter, um, and uh, a number of human rights documents, which again have not really in the past been thought of as tools, but these really are uh, powerful tools that we can use to provide the context for uh, for health equity. Um, now, now what about diagnostic tools? And so here's a list of uh, and a very truncated list of of tools that we could you, we can consider as diagnostic tools in our toolkit um, root cause analysis the work that's being done internationally but also uh, um, I think done really extremely well by Rajiv Bhatia and the um, and San Francisco uh, health impact assessments and environmental impact assessments and budget analyses and again using human rights as a as a tool and not just as an ethereal theoretical document uh, uh, and so on and so forth and a set of indicators um, which um, this is a set of indicators, equity indicators that have been generated uh, by a group out of Connecticut, which are which is an example of a way of using indicators um, in um, uh, as a as a tool and a set of intervention tools. Um, the role of the ombudsman and the child friendly cities and so on and so forth as a set of tools that we can use in this uh, equity based uh, quiver so to speak. Um, and if we look at some of these in our equity toolkit and there's just several more slides left and we'll get to questions and comments and observations. Um, if we look at a set of tools that we can use on the clinical level we have root cause analysis, the medical home, uh, the medical legal uh, partnerships that are developing. At the community level, we can use health impact assessments and the baby friendly hospital um, uh, movement uh, as a set of tools. And at the public policy level, we can use the framework of the child friendly city and the children's ombudsperson as tools to help us advance advocacy for children at these three levels of 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 um, of uh, advocacy. So, um, in summary, and uh, uh, the next steps for that we would we would put on the table to begin uh, or continue this journey is to expand our understanding of child health equity and its relationship to 
child health practice, to expand our inventory of tools, uh, to recruit and engage multiple uh, colleagues in this endeavor, and to redefine our child health practice as equity-based system of care. Um, and uh, this, this set of webinars, um, uh, uh, the intent through, the, through SETCH and through the Alliance is to begin to use webinars as a way for educating and integrating our work. The next set of webinars uh, will include a focus on the life course science and uh, a number of folks including Clyde Hertzman and Michael Liu and Neil Halfon will be presenting on the life course science. Uh, we're going to be having a s uh, several presentations on global climate change, um, work on how do we integrate these concept of rights into practice, how do we use the equity toolkit, and work on poverty and social justice, and quite frankly, um, whatever webinars people are interested in uh, participating in and developing. So that gets us uh, to the end here. And I want to thank, again, thank Jane for, um, for uh, helping us make sure that this webinar happened. Um, and why don't we move directly now over to the questions that people had. Uh, Barbara had a few observations. Um, uh, the distinction between child, children's, and children's is not clear. It seems that you have you have divided equity into a focus on individual children's rights and its subpopulations and populations. Um, well, here is uh, um, here's where we run into a little bit of a difficulty, and that is giving Barbara um, the floor to really define this in any more define the question in in more detail. Uh, Barbara, as you see, says, I do not agree that infectious conditions are no longer important. There is an important uh, school of thought uh, and evidence that infections pay, play an important role in the genesis of chronic illnesses. Viewed in a life course perspective, we need to stop thinking about silos of disease and thinking of a continuity of attention, both health services uh, and social services over the life course. The, uh, the International Journal of Equity and Health a BMC is journal is available for health is. equity issues as defined by the International Society for Health Equity. Um, I can assign a and um, Jane, there's no way of there's no way of engaging uh, participants now to hear their voice. Is there? Well, that's a good thing to remember for the future. I guess. Barbara, um, yeah, and again, this was really meant as a first step. Um, Barbara, do you have a, you, you don't by any chance have a mic, but it's not set up. All right. Well, um, in the future, um, in the future, what we would ask people to do who we can enable you to speak via microphone, um, the only thing that we would need for you to do is have the mic turned off during the present presentation. Um, well, that's going to happen. Just and so Barbara's, Barbara's uh, comments and all that. are I can try. well taken and see. certainly will be there for, um, for discussion in the future and perhaps Okay, she should, um, have, she should have a mic if she comes back to us. Okay, Barbara plugged in her mic, but Lauren lost all input from me. Can can we can we enable her mic? All right. Well, Jerison. Um, Jerison's remarks are there. Children do. Well, while we're waiting to see how we do this, um, um, Jerison's remarks are that children do have rights both as individuals and as a constituency. For example, governments have obligations to implement policies to promote children's best interests as individuals but also for children in the wider community. Um, 
uh, for example, environmental issues, planning, creating opportunities for play, and so on. So, um, so if I can, I, if I can distill that uh, dialectic, so to speak, uh, the question that Barbara's asking about is uh, um, the issue of individuals versus groups of children, and um, and Jerison's comments that children have rights both as individuals and also as a as a population um, as as well. Braun had a question. I just wanted to throw out my idea for folks to ponder. Braun, do you want to throw out your idea to ponder? Moving from the theoretical to the practical, I would like to propose yeah, that we I work with the. Above. What's that? Go ahead, Jeff. I was just telling you it was it was there. Is Barbara Mike enabled? Jane? Yes, it is. Barbara? I don't know if she's back. Can you? Uh, yes, it. Yes, her her mic is enabled, but but she may have lost us completely. Oh. By setting it up. All right, Barbara. If we lost you, we apologize, and this will give us an opportunity to learn how to use the technology a little better. Um, Bronze, uh, bronze comment. It helps if I turn it on. Does that make a difference? Barbara, that makes a great difference. There she is. Okay, does everyone hear Barbara? Yep, yeah, turning it on helped. Turning my mic on. Well, it's, you know, it's, a, it's the story of the, the journey of a thousand miles starting okay, with the there. first step. <laughs> well, go ahead, Barbara. The other issue is um, her speakers. If she. If, if Barbara's not on a headset, then we're going to get the um, echo of your voice or my voice through her speakers. But but go ahead. We'll work through it. Go ahead, Barbara. I, I, I haven't a headset, but I don't, I'm not getting any echo. Maybe you are. Now, I just wanted to explain the apostrophe. Child oh. is child. Children, apostrophe S, is different from children's apostrophe. Okay. And they are, the first two are individual phenomena, and the third is a population or a subpopulation. And I think that's the essential difference being a, between a rights approach and a social justice approach. Because rights has always been operationalized as rights of individuals. And equity or social justice carries it a little bit further and, and considers systematic differences across population groups or subgroups. So how would you... And your your slides actually switch back and forth from each other. Well, I think that if I were, <laughs> I would place equity first and, and use children's apostrophe. I mean, you were talking about children and children, children's apostrophe rights, which are based on individual rights but are not the same. I mean, if you look at the World Health Report of the year 2000, it operationalized equity as between individuals and they really were addressing rights then then uh, jane if i if if i speak can people hear or yes there's I just that okay. delay between this speakers but everyone can hear you jeff well, jerison's comment is but if every child has a right then government must act to introduce policies and legislation which ensure the realization of those rights for all children, e.g. social protection, social protection measures. And, and I, would add, I would add to that, Barbara, also the, when, the, when the convention was framed, it was framed as the Convention on the Rights of the Child and not the Convention on the Rights of Children. Um, and there, there was a particular reason for doing that, recognizing that if you identify the rights of each individual child, they could be summed to, the, uh, to, to include all children. But unless they were, unless they were, it was prioritized as the right of every child, that you would lose the individual child in the, in the context of the population of all children. Yes, 
else I just think that, that says that they're different. Both are important, but they're different. Okay. Bron, you had a comment that said yes. What, what do you mean by that? Brian, do you want to write down what you um, mean by yes? Reading his idea. All right. Um, you know, I think, Ron, I was answering the question about the mics. <laughs> okay. A little delayed, but nevertheless, well, well appreciated. Um, you know, th these webinars provide us an opportunity to begin to identify the issues. And one critical issue, I think, is the, um, the question that Barbara brought up, and that is the difference between children and children's. And how do we, I think part of, there has been a, uh, a difference between the work that's happening in equity and uh, in the particular in the broader context of equity and the work that's being done it's been done over the last 20 years in children's rights and there has not been a major intersection between those and in fact when we began to introduce the concept of health equity um, there was somewhat of a pushback um, by some of our colleagues who have been focused on children's rights to suggest that children's rights is really the organizing framework and not equity. And so I think that's one of the important discussions that we need to put on the table, which we can do through a Skype format or through another format that would allow those people who are interested in this part of the discussion uh, to engage in an open dialogue uh, the, um via conference call through through Skype, which we will um, arrange in the future. And I think it would be very important, Barbara, if you um, could participate in that, and Jerison, if you could participate in it, and then we would open it up for other colleagues um, at a time that worked for, uh, for all of us. Does there, are there other comments that people want to make on the on the chat line? All right. So Jerison says the civil and political rights focus on individual freedom, social and economic right. rights address yeah, all yeah, children, but require broad state state of in, in, stated broadly state interventions to create the environments necessary to protect those rights. And if you go back to the um, that inventory. Um, uh, uh, that was presented in the slide that looked at the uh, health equity ethics, that there's an attempt to actually divide the articles into those, um, um, those, different, um, those different groupings. And uh, Jerison is offering CredPro as a go-to meeting system whereby you can talk to each other and see PowerPoints, et cetera. So um, what we'll do is, uh, unless other people have comments to make on the public chat. Um, we will um, uh, end this webinar and again thank everybody for participating and for Jane of helping make it happen. Um, we will uh, schedule a time um, to engage people in these particular issues. Um, we will uh, post this webinar to uh, to the website, both the SETS website and the Alliance website. We will have a webinar every um, uh, every fourth uh, Wednesday of the month and perhaps one way that we could, one way of fr another webinar we could have is actually a summary of the work that uh, comes out of that um, that discussion that Jerison and, and Barbara have launched us on. Um, and what we need is the following. We need people to 
join Satch and the Alliance to use this as a venue, these two organizations and as a venue to move this dialogue and discussion. Um, and I need to personally thank uh, all of you who've been on here. And those of you like Barbara and Jerison and Nick and Tony and Raul and, uh, and others that have really helped us get to the point where we are today and CredPro um, with establishing a uh, funding source to help us uh, get to this get to this point. So, having said all of that, uh, thank you, and uh, um, we'll look forward to this as a uh, first step in a, a long journey together. And that's it. So you press the button at the top that says exiting meeting. <laughs>